If you were to make a cheesy Hollywood sports movie about modern test rugby, Fiji would likely be your protagonists. A hard-working group of good, honest people from humble beginnings playing breathtakingly beautiful rugby for the love of the game, barely a penny's payment in sight. It's a straight up and dog story that makes it very hard to not love Fiji. The little island with hearts against the bigger ones with wallets. It'd be called something like The Offload, and would star Kevin Costner as John McKee and Scarlett Johansson as Nimali Nadolo. The story is only helped by the fact that Fiji loves rugby as much as rugby loves Fiji. There are currently over 600 rugby clubs in Fiji. For context, Birmingham has a 10% greater population than Fiji, and yet only has 12 clubs. So how did this overripe Hollywood love story begin, making rugby an integral part of Fijian culture, and Fiji an integral part of rugby culture? After all, it's not like every club in France boasts their own mega-powerful lightning-quick brummy winger. Rugby was introduced to Fiji by British and Kiwi soldiers stationed there during the late 1800s. Whilst colonisation by the British is a pretty cliched meat cute for new countries in rugby, it wasn't long before these soldiers realised what Wales, Scotland, Australia, and most recently France have all realised. Fijians are brilliant at rugby. So brilliant, in fact, that just two years after introducing the game to locals, the British racially segregated the leagues so that they didn't have to deal with the embarrassment of being beaten by Islanders at their game every single match. This carried through to the first ever Fijian representative team in 1913, which was entirely full of white guys. And not just white guys, but white guys with names like Sir Ernest Bickham Sweet Escott, which is a name so Tory just saying it out loud because NHS funding by 3%. The British military presence lessened over the next decade, leading to a far more representative team when Fiji finally played their first full test match in 1924 against Western Samoa, a match played at 7 in the morning so that afterwards the Samoan players could go to work and Fiji could carry on travelling to Tonga in order to play another game that afternoon. Since the advent of the World Cup in 1987, Fiji have become the team that everyone wants to watch, albeit in someone else's pool. Famous for playing fast, flary rugby, serving as grand proprietors of the Miracle Ball. Their most famous day came in 2007, knocking Wales out of the World Cup and prompting my valley boy father to do things that we, as a family, vowed to never, ever, ever speak of again. Fiji did it that day by inviting Wales to play the Fijian way, by turning off tactics and forcing Wales into a mad day of over-exuberant attacking rugby. However, in 2015, Kevin Cock, John McKee, tried to put his own stamp upon Fijian rugby. Seemingly based on the model of Samoa in 2011-12, who beat Australia, Scotland and, of course, Wales, by putting far more structure on the game than most island sides, using intelligent halfback play to get the most out of their massive forward pack, who, if these just lay down in the water long enough, would probably each qualify as Pacific Islands on their own. But this didn't really work as hopes for Fiji. It served as damage limitation, preventing Wales Australia posting big scores against them. But they never really looked like causing an upset. However, since then, McKee seems to have taken inspiration from the other great island success story of recent years, his adopted nation Sevens team. And in particular, the work of Sevens side genius and the only ginger for gene chief, Ben Ryan. Since its inception in the late 70s, Rugby Sevens has suited Fiji like a suit. They won three of the first five Hong Kong Sevens titles and continued to sporadically dominate the game right up until it became too professional for them to keep up. The team relying on natural talent still without the resources of other sides. This is where Ben Ryan came in. Turning up to a wooden shack on the beach after quitting his job with, in his words, the machine at Twickenham that had blunted his creative instincts, he immediately set about trying to work within the limitations of the Fijian budget. The team had a habit of being erratic and crashing hard, but Fiji couldn't afford a sports psychologist, so Ryan banned sugar from their diets and observed it worked just as well. He built the side into a close-knit group who all trusted his instincts, buying into alien concepts to Fiji, like fitness training and turning up on time. Less alien, however, was their game plan. Inspired by watching the way people played rugby on the beach or in the street in Fiji, Ryan built a uniquely Fijian style of play. The idea was simple. Keep the ball alive. Pass, offload, whatever it takes to avoid the tackle. If that means going backwards, so be it. Just avoid reaching a ruck. It negates the other team's advantage at the breakdown and worked on the simple principle that the defence can't organise when the ball is off the ground. They can only react to the situation in front of them and hope their teammates will do so as well. Fiji won back-to-back -back Sevens World Series in 2015 and 16 before his work culminated in Fiji's first ever Olympic gold medal, a feat that made him the only ginger on Fijian national currency. Whilst it's impossible to replicate the structure in 15s, McKee has taken as much as he can from Ryan's approach to the lighter game. In modern rugby, the most popular attacking shape is known as a 1-3-3-1, which basically means you put a forward on either wing and two pods of three forwards each in the middle of the pitch. Fiji instead play a shape probably best described as 1-3... They play with one pod in case they want to either try and generate quick ball or slow the game down, and instead of positioning the other forwards together with support, they dot them around the pitch in the way you would backs, 
granting Fiji almost a second backline, allowing them to pull moves like this, playing out the back twice before straightening. This is possible for Fiji in a way it isn't for other nations, because Fiji don't really do positions. Players like Pensiliato and Levani Bottia can play to professional standard in both the forwards and the backs. However, even more impressive is Leone Nakarawa, who kind of throws the underdog story thing under a bus by being an actual real-life superhero. Most humans can only bend their arms at the elbow, but Nakarawa seems to have at least 13 points of articulation in his limbs, able to twist his hands free in any situation and keep the ball alive. Having absurd ball players like him, Yato, and the underrated Tafita Kavabati throughout their pack allows them to play the kind of ludicrous all-out sex rugby that Fiji loves to play. Other key players for Fiji include Power Tribe vending machine Joshua Tuasova, frankly overpowered with Nomani Andolo, and man of the match in the winner of France, Semi Rodrada, who's inappropriately named because he gives me a full-on erection. However, perhaps the most important player to Fiji is less of an unequivocal star, fly half Ben Volavola. Everything about Volavola is completely inexplicable. Simultaneously shit and sublime, Volavola is a kind of player who can arguably have the game of his life, nailing kicks, creating space, picking the perfect options, and still at one point to forget to catch the ball when it's passed back to him for a clearance. But look at it, he doesn't drop it, he doesn't miss it, he just forgets to catch it. Even more inexplicably, he's also going out with Shailene Woodley, as in, yet that that Shailene Woodley, movie star Shailene Woodley from Foreign Our Stars and Diversion and Gregor Aki's underrated and underseen Why Bird in a Blizzard. Back to rugby though, and the previously mentioned backs heavy structure Fiji played puts a lot of pressure on the fly half to make the right decisions, even more so than most teams. With the role of forward carries minimised, all go forward is generated off 10, meaning Fiji are reliant on Vola Vola keeping a clear head and not missing the ball because he was too busy trying to work out if he actually saw the one about the blizzard. But no matter how ingrained Vola Vola gets in movie star glamour, the Hollywood ending for Fiji still looks some way off. The win over France showcased a grit about the team that they can defend as well as attack, but the game against Scotland a few weeks earlier showed what can happen if you do crack Fiji. All it took was Scotland taking the lead just before half-time, for Fiji to open house and tell Seymour's try to bring all its friends. However, the loss to Scotland doesn't diminish the win over France, only put in context. Fiji are capable of upsets, but not likely enough of them to win a World Cup. Not eating sugar can only get you so far. Without the wallets of the bigger islands, it's going to be hard for Fiji to ever fund a winning campaign, no matter the talent in their team, because some things never change. For over 100 years now, the flying Fijians have been beating richer white men, but for just as long, the richer white men have been finding new ways to use their money to get themselves ahead. The World Cup schedule demands a level of conditioning only the best teams can afford to put their players through. And though the introduction of the Fijian draw into the Australian Rugby National Championship has allowed the island to get more players to a higher level of rugby, it's a small step towards solving a big problem, a problem that will likely never be solved, with the larger nations consistently taking larger steps at the same time. It's perhaps not the ending the screenwriters wanted with their great love going unrequited, but the in fact, Fiji, against all odds, through just heart and flair, can pull off these Hollywood wins is the true sign that theirs is an underdog story worth telling. Hello, me again. I hope you had a lovely few weeks in the time I have made a video. Um, I've slept in that time, which has been quite nice. I've already slept more this month than I did the entirety of last month, by which I mean I've had more than four hours. Um, yeah, hopefully you enjoyed that. That's part four of a series I want to do on every team in the World Cup. So there's 60 more of those coming up over the next few months leading into the World Cup in September next year. Um, and then additionally, I want to say quickly thank you to everyone that supported the channel on Patreon. There's a few more of you popping over, uh, up over the last month in November. Really appreciate that. And to Rugby Warfare for continuing to sponsor the channel. Um, if you want to use the offer code SQ20 for 20% off any of their top rugby goods, you can do that. Um, otherwise, other things you can do include stopping watching this video when it ends right now.